three, two, one. Welcome everyone to Reptile and Amphibian Day, our fifth day of awesome reptile and amphibian activities. I'm Carrie. I'm an educator at the North Carolina Museum of Natural Sciences, and we are so excited about this next program, Salamander Stories. So I want you to tell me in the chat um, a little bit about the stories in your life. So we all have animals in our lives. So whether pets or wildlife that we encounter or we learn about, we want to know what is a life lesson an animal in your life has taught you. So while you're putting those answers in the chat, I'm going to go ahead and uh, get us started. Um, so I do want everyone to put all your questions for our expert in the chat. Um, put your comments, um, talk to us in there, but just make sure that you keep it on topic. Uh, make sure that you're uh, talking about the same things we're talking about. Um, don't spam the chat on us. Um, and so what we're going to do now is uh, talk to our expert. So Cabrin Madison is a conservationist and creative from Eastern North Carolina. She works as a wildlife diversity technician for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, focusing on reptiles and amphibians of, the, of greatest conservation need. So she's a first generation college graduate and is passionate about helping others like her break through barriers and into conservation work. So Karen, welcome to Reptile and Amphibian Days. Yeah, thank you so much. I'm so happy to be here. Awesome. Well, let's see. I'm going to check our friends in the chat and see. Um, <laughs> so uh, let's see. Um, <laughs> Skelly says that's a tough question. <laughs> so let me, so I guess I will. Uh, so I'll think I'll, I'll answer it for me. So life lesson is, um, I think that when you are thinking about nature and wildlife, I think that the most important lesson is how everything is balanced and we can, you know, so you have your predators and your prey and your, you know, tree areas and your meadow areas. And it's just this beautiful balance that everything has evolved to, to live in. And I think that that is a really good lesson that we can use in our lives with balancing maybe our work and our home or school and fun, things like that. So that's my life lesson. Oh, that's awesome. Thank you. Yeah. I think we can get lessons from all sorts of things like snails can teach us how to slow down and yeah. <laughs> exactly, exactly. All right. So, um, so I've, so Katie was telling me that um, we didn't hear the question. So the question is what life lesson has an animal in your life taught you? So if you have an answer to it, just put that in the chat and uh, Kevin, I think that we can go ahead and get started. Um, all right. Hi, everyone. Uh, as Carrie introduced me, I'm Kabrin Madison, and today I'm going to give you my talk called Salamander Stories. Um, and it's going to be my journey to become a wildlife biologist and the lessons that I've got um, had from salamanders along the way. So a little bit about me, just heard a tidbit, but yes, I'm from Eastern North Carolina. I do work for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, essentially a dream job for a big nerd like me. I'm a graduate from Appalachian State and a Jack Kent Cooke Foundation Transfer Scholar. And what this talk is gonna essentially be is my journey. I'm gonna go over six salamanders that I encountered on the way to become a wildlife biologist and then lessons that they've given me, which is why we were kind of curious about animals in your life that have given you lessons. So on my path to become a wildlife biologist, I definitely took the road less traveled. Um, I'm what you would call a non-traditional student. I didn't do the high school, college, get a job track, which you start asking around, you'll kind of find is uh, pretty common. I was always passionate about animals, but growing up, I always just heard, if you love animals, you should be a vet or you should work at a zoo. And neither one of those really felt like quite it for me, but I wasn't really sure of what else was out there. 
So in the meantime, I spent years, I worked at a bank, I worked at restaurants, um, just kind of unsure of my path. And then eventually went back to school at 25. Um, but I, I still didn't really know. I thought I was going to try to study biology and kind of see where I went from there. Enter Nash Community College. Uh, so these photos crack me up. They're of uh, kind of my first little field biology course that I took. And the professor that happened to teach that, lucky for me, is Dr. Dr. David Beamer, who's a salamander biologist. So I didn't really know much about salamanders, much about wildlife biology at all. Um, and the next thing you know, I'm kind of in the forest with a backpack on, um, being told to look for salamanders and um, really excited about it and uh, kind of on a new journey. And I just like to show these slides and remind people that are out there that maybe haven't had access to nature. Um, I did grow up in an urban area. I wasn't really outside very often. You know, I wasn't hiking trails or exposed to much wildlife that it's really never too late um, to start figuring out and, and getting out there and seeing what you love. There were some bumps in the road. So uh, Dr. David Beamer, my first mentor, loves to share the anecdote that uh, one of the first things I ever said to him was that I didn't want to take an 8 a.m. class. I was not a star student. Um, I placed in, they make you take, you know, kind of uh, math placement tests. And I placed in beginners remedial math, the lowest possible one, and had to reteach myself a ton of math. My biology degree that I was working for required calculus up to calculus two. And I started to think like, maybe science isn't for me. You know, I'm not really seeing people that look like me. I'm not really feeling like this path is, is you know, easy enough or something that was aligning, but enter salamanders. So it was, uh, you know, on those field biology courses that I started to realize and learn from David Beamer that Science isn't just, um, you know, people in a lab coat, you know, doing a bunch of, analyzing a bunch of data. Uh, it can also be done in the field. Uh, it can also, I hope you can hear, there's a helicopter coming really <laughs> loud. So I'll talk, wait one second for that. Yeah, so essentially you see me in the field here. Uh, some of my first chances to really get out there and find salamanders and see what kind of research kind of science could be done with them. So my first research experience was with Northern Dusky and Carolina Mountain Dusky salamanders. See on the top right here, that's actually Carolina Mountain Dusky salamander. He's got kind of a circular tail um, where he is a more of a terrestrial salamander, which means he lives on land. And then on the bottom, you've got our northern dusky salamander that has more of that compressed tail that they kind of use as a paddle in the water. These are both stream salamanders. They're very different sizes. These photos are a little bit misleading, but the one on the top is actually pretty small. And the one on the bottom, the northern dusky salamander is uh, much, much larger. Now, I won't get into the nitty gritty details of the genetics here, but what I essentially learned through Dr. David Beamer is that um, both of these salamanders sh shared the same mitochondrial DNA, which suggests that they possibly hybridized a really, really long time ago. And so my first research experience was going out into the forest, like you kind of just saw in those previous photos, uh, looking for these salamanders and then trying to see, do they still hybridize? Is this something that's still happening? And then I ended up with 40 salamanders in my bedroom, which uh, was an adventure to say the least. I always like to add that this is not a dead salamander. He's just uh, knocked out for the moment. He's just anesthetized, so we were measuring him. Um, but in order to see if they still hybridized, we paired them up to see if they would breed and ended up finding out that there was no kind of modern hybridization happening, which helped us fill in the gaps of Dr. Beamer's um, dissertation research. And my first salamander lesson, the very first one um, from the Mountain Dusky and the Northern Dusky is that all is not as it seems and there's so much that we don't know. Uh, so this is kind of what I'm getting at with the life lessons from animals. Uh, this lesson, there being so much we don't know, really pushed me to keep going in the sciences and see what else I could figure out. David, I think that's so fun. Um, we were, when we were, doing our practice, I think that a lot of us who were on the call um, realized that we had such a similar experience to you, where we all loved animals, we're passionate about <laughs> animals and wildlife, but really the only careers we knew about 
were like veterinarian or maybe working in a zoo, like you said. And so I love yeah. that um, that your your experience mirrors so many of our experiences. I know. I, I want to always share with people, you know, field biology and wildlife biology is a thing. You, you don't have to, you know, be a vet for cats and dogs. You don't have to work at a zoo. You can really be out in the field and out in nature with these animals and kind of saving them on the ground. And that's where I kind of found the inspiration there. So it's good to know that there are others out there who were just as confused as me as a kid. <laughs> we all found our way. <laughs> right. And we have a comment from Reese in the chat says, wow, I want to go to Appalachian. And I went to the New River to look for a hellbender, but didn't find one. But they've well, seen a lot of marbled ones. Oh, that's awesome. Yeah. Oh, uh, well, that's really relevant. I'm actually about to get into Appalachian State here in a little bit. So, right. yeah. Awesome. awesome. Yeah, so this is uh, when I was able to do that research. It gave me the opportunity to go, even as a community college student, and often one of the only community college students um, at scientific conferences. I was able to meet other scientists, see the work that they were doing. Um, and this is what I like to call kind of my aha moment of, even though you know calculus was kicking my butt and the organic chemistry was making me want to cry all the time, science was for me and it is for everyone. And there's so many different avenues that can be taken and mine just happened to be chasing salamanders around. <laughs> These opportunities also led me um, to meet people like the awesome, inspiring state herpetologist for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission, Jeff Hall. These are photos of me and him on one of those field biology courses that I took in 2015. And then that allowed me to get um, interested in the work that the Wildlife Commission was doing. And I found out about the Noose River Dog Watch, which are some of my other first field experiences. Um, the Noose River water dog is a salamander that is um, endemic to Eastern NC, so I often joke that we're both endemic to the same place. Endemic means only found there, that's where they're from. Um, and they're endemic to the tar and Noose River drainages, which run right through my hometown. I had no idea that they existed until I started studying salamanders. And one of the reasons why I had no idea they existed is because they're kind of known for their super secretive behavior. They live in these large, chocolatey, slow-moving uh, rivers, and you kind of have to be looking for them to find them. Um, they're often called the Forgotten Dragons. There's actually a little YouTube video that I think will come up if you want to Google Forgotten Dragons and Water Dog. It's really awesome. It's just released. Um, and they're considered water quality indicators to us. So their presence in rivers um, means that the rivers are healthy, essentially. And once you start to lose them in the places that they historically were, we can kind of know that that's a warning. It's almost like their presence is a warning for us. And threats to them are agriculture and development. Um, you know, there's a lot of residential development that's happening that's causing a lot of issues with the streams that they inhabit. So part of the Noose River Water Dog Watch and the work I was involved in was to see how they were doing. Are they still there? Where can we still find them? And the lesson from this wonderful Noose River Water Dog is that sometimes magic is right under our nose. This is me letting one of them go. It's always my favorite part is letting the wild things still be wild, right? Um, and yeah, it's just really special to me because I lived in this area my whole life, had no idea that there are these special little guys with their tiny little hands and their gills. They're so sweet. <laughs> they, are, they are precious. And so I um, have a question. So how are they doing? So with your study, did you find that the water quality is pretty good or... Not so yeah, so there's actually a graduate student um, named Eric at NC State who has been working on the Noose River Water Dog um, for almost, I think, three years now. And it was a master's degree that's now turning into a PhD. Bless him. Bless you, Eric, if you see this. Um, and so he's really the man that is figuring it all out. Um, we think that they're doing much better in the Tar River Basin than they are in the Noose River Basin. And if you start to think about it, that makes a lot of sense. If you think about the development that's happening in North Carolina, it's all happening around the Raleigh, the Triangle area, which is where that Noose River is. Um, and then the Tar River, of course, is a much more rural kind of area. So we're seeing a lot more water dogs in the Tar River area than we are in the Noose River. Um, which makes us think that, of course, the water quality might be a little bit better um, in the Tor River than it is in the Noose, though all of that is still being worked out as we speak. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. Of course. 
Next salamander is our Eastern hellbender, the largest salamander in North America. Uh, they live in fast flowing cold streams. They get up to two feet long. So really, really remarkable guys. Um, and they're often called, they have a ton of different names. People call them snot otters because they feel a little bit like slimy when you pick them up. And then one of my favorites, and I think this photo is a great example of it, is they're called uh, lasagna monsters. And so if you <laughs> look at this picture and see on the side of its body, it's got kind of this like lasagna noodle look which is really interesting and helps them um, absorb oxygen from the water. And this is also another species that's really important to us because they are indicative of the water quality. When we start to lose them in areas, again, just like the Noose River water dog, we start to realize that the water quality is probably going down. And hellbenders are in crisis. Um, you know, this has kind of been known for a little while. The, uh, they were actually denied endangered species protection in April, 2019. Um, threats to them are siltation, which is a phenomenon that happens if you imagine kind of residential development and all of that soil that's been moved all around, grass that's removed, vegetation that's removed, it rains and all of that mud and clay makes its way slowly into the rivers and then fills in those little cracks that um, baby hellbenders or larval hellbenders would use to hide and um, use as their habitat. So they've experienced an 80% population decline. And even though they were denied endangered species protection, there was actually a lawsuit filed very, very recently by an organization called the Waterkeeper Alliance that's gonna try to fight that decision by the US Fish and Wildlife Service and get the hellbenders um, endangered species protection, which would be amazing. So, so what was the reason given for denying them protection? Yeah, I mean, it gets really sticky with um, kind of classifying any species as endangered because of course, if you classify it as endangered that can affect private land owners and things like that. So when you have these aquatic species where their habitat covers a large amount of um, land and property, it, you know, it's kind of hard to want to list them. Um, they, they pretty much said that they're not doing bad enough to be listed um, as an endangered species, which, you know, this is the hard thing about science is uh, different people kind of interpret data in different ways. Um, groups like the Waterkeeper Alliance and biologists like myself would love to see an endangered species status for the hellbender just because we do know they are so sensitive. They are so important to our environment. But of course, um, you know, other people might not feel the same way. So we'll see. This is uh, my first and actually only encounter with uh, a juvenile hellbender. And what to a lot of people would look like somebody just holding like a random brown salamander was a huge deal. <laughs> so I'm a community college student at this point. Um, and here I am holding something that's kind of proof that these hellbenders are breeding in the wild, um, that there might be reproduction in the stream that I happen to be in, um, which gives us a little bit of hope, you know, and wants us to, made me want to keep going and figure out ways that I could empower myself and others to want to help fight for these guys. And so my lesson from the hellbender, um, here I am with a large hellbender that we found. Um, is that you can be strong and gentle. So these guys are essentially a muscle in your hand when you're holding them. They're so strong, but they're also so gentle natured and really awesome. And I hope that, I think it was Reese who commented about hellbenders. I hope you get to see one one day. And something I always like to mention about hellbenders is um, if you are out looking for them, just be very, very careful and really try to at all costs avoid picking up rocks and moving any large rocks around. Um, they do consider that, you know, those rocks are their homes and, you know, if somebody picked up your house and moved it around, that's not ideal, right? So just try to protect their habitat and uh, make sure that we're not make, having any accidents like crushing hellbenders and things like that. And stacking rocks, that's not a good thing yeah. to do in nature either, is it? Exactly. So um, there's like the little rock sculptures that you see, um, people call them cairns or cairns <laughs> um, all around. And those are really problematic as well. So you're, you know, you're moving rocks from the habitat that um, have a purpose, um, are serving as habitat for these animals. And then, you know, they can topple over, they can crush animals that are underneath them. So if you see those um, when you're in Appalachia, I, I actually um, try to very carefully, you know, not kick them down or anything, but very slowly take them down and kind of replace the rocks back into the water. And that's a really helpful thing to do. 
That's awesome. It's a good, a good action. So if we see those, we know that it's best for the, for the wildlife if we remove them. Absolutely. And yeah, I always, I always really try to reiterate to be careful and you might get a, a fun little surprise when you're moving them. Cause often I, I go to remove the little rock sculptures and I'll find not hellbender, but tiny little, you know, the stream salamanders that I was mentioning earlier, like the Northern Dusky or um, similarly related species, the um, black belly salamander kind of hanging out near those rocks underneath. So yeah, it's always a good thing. You're helping and you might get a fun surprise. <laughs> Yeah, so talking about Appalachian State, yeah, um, it's a wonderful area. The entire Appalachian region is rich with salamander diversity and has the highest diversity of salamanders of anywhere on the planet. Um, so the research that I was able to do, field work experiences that I had with the New River Water Dog and um, the dusky salamanders I mentioned earlier really shaped my journey and all of that research and field experience uh, allowed me to be awarded the Jack Kent Cook Foundation Scholarship, which let me go to any school in the United States and I chose Appalachian State University because it is what I like to call salamander mecca and just surrounded with so many opportunities to continue to research these salamanders and see where it would take me. Our next salamander that I began encountering all the time when I was uh, in Appalachia is the Eastern Newt. These guys are kind of known for being like ubiquitous <laughs> all over kind of, I don't even want to say the Southeast, just all over the Eastern United States. Um, and they're awesome. This face that you're seeing, and I'll get into that in a second, is what we call the red eft. A little bright, or to me they look orange, but <laughs> bright orange guys. The interesting thing about these salamanders, you can see here in this wonderful infographic, is that they have what we call a triphasic life cycle. So they start off, you can kind of see on the bottom left here, uh, like a tadpole would. You know, they've got their little aquatic juvenile stage where they hatch out of an egg and live in the water. Then, like a lot of other salamander species, they emerge into this terrestrial form, and most salamanders would kind of stay there. They stay as that kind of semi-aquatic or terrestrial form. Well, these Fs are really, really fascinating because they walk around in this bold orange version of themselves, I like to call the kind of their teenager version, um, where they're, they're very, very poisonous to anything that would want to eat them, so they're not shy at all. And then, in order to reproduce, they go back into the water. Um, their entire body plan changes again. You can see in the wonderful drawing that their tail compresses into kind of that paddle shape that I discussed in the other species earlier. And they spend the rest of their lives as a fully aquatic version underneath the water. So really, really fascinating. Um, so much change happens in that life cycle. I have a question uh, about the, the new, so what is, the, how, what, I guess what instigates the, the change from the red F to the adult aquatic newt? That is a great question that I'm really not sure anyone has the answer to, unfortunately. Um, we, we're not even sure how long they can stay this F phase. Um, you know, it was thought it was only a few years. Um, there've been some suggestions it can be over 10 years. So they're walking around. In this <laughs> wow, I never, I know that, I, that you mentioned, I'm like, wow, <laughs> I never thought about how long they would be at. I, That's yeah, I love to think about that too. Anytime, you know, I'm interacting with a wild animal, just to think of their story. Um, you know, I'm holding this little tiny eft and he could have been hanging out in that forest for a decade. <laughs> you know? Which is crazy. I mean, it is crazy because when I see the eft, I'm like, oh, you're a little teenager. But, but in, in the other thing I... I'm just astounded at is how long these salamanders can live. Exactly. Yeah. So. And that's another thing that we're not even sure about. Species like the hellbender, um, we don't really have a life expectancy for them yet. It can only really be educated guesses. Um, and the easiest way, the best way to put it is to say they live a really long time. <laughs> you know, um, so it's fascinating, this little guy. Um, we're not sure if it's environmental conditions that maybe get them to go back into the water. Um, maybe there's a hormonal change that happens, but if so, what triggers it? Um, that's probably a PhD waiting to happen or one that might already be happening. I know, Sometimes. maybe it's one of our, maybe it's one of the people in, watching today, their, their PhD project. I know, there might be someone listening that's like, I actually know that. So, yeah, if you do, put it in the chat, let us know. I wanna learn it. 
All right, I love this video because this really shows just like how common they are when you do find them. Um, this is the adult version that you're seeing mostly. There's a couple of tadpoles kind of thrown in there, but this was from, from one trap um, at a place that I was surveying to see what the pond community was. And you got a bunch of those adult uh, newts here and they're just so funny. Do you know what kind of tadpoles the tadpoles are in that? Video. Oh man, it was a couple of years ago, but I'm pretty sure that they were green frog tadpoles and there might have been wood frog tadpoles, but I'm not That's positive. Cool. Yeah, I love wood frogs. They're awesome. They, they are so awesome. <laughs> I love this video of the eft because it just shows when I talk about them being bold, how he just does not care. <laughs> like that, it's like, oh, I'm not even sure that this is a hand, whatever. I'm just making my way. Uh, mine and my business completely unfazed by me so the lesson from this salamander is to be bold and that change is necessary and okay and so it was a great reminder on my journey um, where so much change was happening in my life I was going you know like you mentioned I'm a first generation grad uh, undergraduate student I'm the first person to go to college definitely the first person to study science of any kind and a lot of change was happening and they reminded me that it's just part of life and it's okay gotta lean into it and be cute and sassy while you're doing it right aren't they cute <laughs> absolutely adorable they I'll find them um on the road you know around my house oh, and I always gently escort them to the side I um, love being a salamander escort <laughs> yeah all right, our final salamander, the spotted salamander. I love these guys. Uh, so this photo always cracks me up. I can't even talk when I see it. <laughs> oh, so the spotted salamanders are mole salamanders in a family that we call the ambistomatids. Um, the whole group are considered mole salamanders and they're called that because they spend most of their life underground. Most of the time you're not going to see them. They're kind of living in these little tunnels. You don't really know what they're doing. Just hanging out, eating a bunch of invertebrates for us. Um, but they're often very, very easy to find at specific times of the year. So they have these mass breeding events triggered by environmental conditions, the right temperature, the right amount of rain, um, where the males leave the burrows first or the little underground chambers first um, and enter what we call ephemeral ponds, which are ponds that um, are essentially are not always there. It's just the easiest way to put it. They show up during the winter rains, filled with water. And then as it gets warmer throughout the spring and summer, most of the time they dry down. I'm sure a lot of people in Eastern North Carolina will be very familiar with that. They're like, I probably have one of those in my backyard. Yeah, I'm pretty sure I have one in my front yard. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> and with all the rain we recently had too. That's yes, awesome. exactly. <laughs> we all had some ephemeral ponds. <laughs> Exactly. So they, most of the time they're using ones that are a little more established, but um, they have these mass breeding events where you can just find hundreds of them at the time, at, at a time. Uh, and the photo on the right, uh, where you can see its little belly is actually a female that we would call gravid. And if you look kind of at the bottom towards her, right above her legs, you can see where it goes from a dark purple color to kind of a lighter color. And those are actually the eggs in her belly, which is really, really awesome. Um, they make this journey, you know, the females are very slow and filled with eggs and you can tell they're like, oh, I just had to walk so far to get to this pond, but we love to escort them across the road also. Uh, threats to these guys are roadkill for sure. So because they are having these kind of mass events, a lot of them end up in the road and you know they can get hit by cars but also habitat loss so the loss of ephemeral um, wetlands you know caused by either climate change or just development over a wetland areas that were historically used for breeding by spotted salamanders is a huge problem for them um, but I, I always like to say that this salamander helped me a lot during my time at Appalachian State um, I would call it my second semester blues salamander where I'm feeling really tired. They'd always, you know, it's the second semester. I'm almost done, but trucking through, uh, not quite to spring break yet is when they would show up. Uh, it's cold, it's been the winter, and then you get those first little peaks of spring, uh, the first couple of warm nights where it rains, and then 
yeah, sure enough, you can find them and predict where they'll be. And yeah, that there's nothing like that little face to just cheer you up when you're going through college. <laughs> it's adorable. I love the eyes. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Oh, I know. They're little bug eyes. They're so awesome. And uh, interesting thing about them is uh, they don't have a way to really like swallow. You know, their mouths are very different than us. And so their eyes are bugged out like that but when they swallow they'll close them and it pushes the food down their throat so it's really cute oh, that's so cool lots of videos of that uh, so our last salamander lesson of the day is that sometimes it takes the big and scary journey to get where you are meant to be and that's definitely a spotted salamander lesson there um you know they in order to breed every single year they have to leave the safety of their burrows um, and walk out in the open, you know, exposed to predators, exposed to human threats, like I mentioned before, um, just to be able to breed. And that always inspired me to keep going um, when, you know, my journey felt big and scary, especially, you know, being someone who wasn't sure what I wanted to do, um, if I'd be able to make it all the way through the degree and become a wildlife biologist, seeing that little face and like, if you can do it, I can. So. <laughs> I love it. Yeah. So we have, so some folks, um, I wanted to share with you some of the, the lessons that, that oh, folks okay. learn from animals. So Reese said, one of the lessons is be yourself and do what you love. Um, and then Rebecca says, um, a lesson from birds, how to be a great and peaceful singer. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> yeah, so I thought those were pretty great. So I yeah, wanted to thank you for share sharing. those with you. Awesome. Um, and so in is saying that um, they want to help hellbenders and keep rivers clean. So I think exactly. that that's a good thing for us all to do. Yes. And we need inspired people for sure. Yes, so that, that sure. inspires me. So thank you. <laughs> yeah. And kind of on that note, salamanders do need our help, you know. Um, one third of all amphibians are at risk for extinction and some studies even suggest that it's up to 43% of them um, that are at risk of either catastrophic decline or extinct already. That's what the IUCN is now reporting. Um, and so that can leave us feeling hopeless, but there's also a lot that people can do. You don't have to be a wildlife biologist to help these animals. Um, I love to recommend people to check out the Amphibian Foundation that can be found online. Facebook, Instagram, and of course they have their own website. And they have a lot of great resources that go into far more detail than I'll be able to go on this talk, but you can do things like have an amphibian friendly yard. Uh, the spotted salamander, for example, that I just showed, I actually had a friend a couple years ago that texted me a photo and said, oh my God, what is this? Like assumed it was a salamander and I'm like, oh, it's a spotted salamander. I explained to him what was happening. Like, that means that they live underground somewhere near where you live and they're crossing through your yard. Your yard is now the highway that they're taking to get to a wetland that's nearby. And it changed the entire way that he um, you know, managed his lawn. He was sweeping all of the leaves out and planting a bunch of things. And now he's leaving that leaf, leaf cover, knows that it's important, has lots of logs in the back and things to kind of make it more amphibian friendly. And, if you think if that change happens across a lot of people, then, you know, we can help a lot of sound manners, hopefully. Absolutely. And um, also arthropod friendly, leaving your leaf litter. And so Miranda and I, who, 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 who um, I'm sure you've seen in some of these other programs, we love this recommendation because we hate raking leaves. Exactly. So. <laughs> I'm like, not only do you not have to rake leaves and like do all that work, you can just like say that, you know, and it's a win-win. It's, it's a wildlife, wildlife friendly yard. There you go. So. Exactly. Call your homeowners association. Tell them that it's for wildlife. <laughs> yes, exactly. Yeah, you can also join a group like uh, the Amphibian Foundation accepts members. Um, they're doing wonderful things. There's ton of a ton of groups online that you know, either do education about amphibians or, you know, we'll just kind of help you connect to other passionate people. Um, I kind of mentioned this a little bit earlier, but ethical herping. Um, herping is, of course, the action of looking for reptiles and amphibians. It's our nerdy word that we describe what we're doing when we're out uh, flipping logs and looking around, but just making sure 
if you find yourself um, watching these programs and becoming really inspired to do things like go out and find hell benders or spotted salamanders, so make sure you're putting everything back exactly as it was. You're not flipping it off and leaving it flipped. You know, we're flipping it back over because all of that, um, we don't, we think about habitat as a big word that means an entire forest, but there's also micro habitat. So it'll be the, you know, the whole area under that rock is its own little ecosystem and we want to preserve that. Other things like Hurt Mapper, which I have the little um, tag for kind of on the bottom here. Um, this is actually something that get, goes directly to the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission. Um, my boss is able to see every record that people upload. And so it's even something that I use when I'm out in the field and I find a hurt, I take a photo and then um, it does a GPS location. It does hide it. You know, it doesn't show the whole exactly where it is to the public, um, but it does show it to the North Carolina Wild Resource, Wildlife Resources Commission. And that way we're able to see who is finding what and where, which helps us track um, how these species are doing. And then there's can a- a, Can I ask a question about Hurt Mapper? So we talk a lot about iNaturalist and probably yeah. I think we've dropped the link to iNaturalist in every single program we've done for <laughs> Reptile and Amphibian Days. So do Hurt Mapper and iNaturalist connect? Do they, do they talk? So if you put something in iNaturalist, will it then go to Hurt Mapper? My understanding is that they do not and that they're two separate apps. Yeah, I'm not sure either. I might be incorrect on that, but my understanding is that Hurt Mapper is much more simple, um, only Hurt Focus, and we'll be going, um, instead of iNaturalist, it's kind of like this giant database um, mm -hmm. that goes to kind of anyone and everywhere. Hurt Mapper is more directly going to people that are looking to conserve and understand where these animals are. Yeah. So, um, so does that mean like if you do find a herp, should you put it in both iNaturalist and I would put it in both. Okay. Yeah. <laughs> and just a little um, kind of some nuance there is I always recommend people to be really careful um, and maybe even block the location. You know, say that you found a spotted salamander or you found a hellbender and you're so excited about it. Um, that's a wonderful treat, but it's something that we want to let keep happening, right? So um, try to maybe hide from the public and Hurt Mapper does offer this option. You can just click it. Um, and that lets the scientists who are studying them and the researchers who are studying them know where you found it. You know where you found it, which is awesome, but it protects it from anyone and everyone who would maybe wanna do some not so good things with these animals, maybe poach them or um, you know, mess up the habitat in some way if it gets a little bit too much traffic. So just making sure we're kind of tying in our, um, our hurt mapper and our iNaturalist pro um, process to that process of ethical herping kind of all goes together. Awesome. And so Mark has a question in the chat. Is it okay to post the same image to both iNaturalist and hurt mapper? 100%. Yeah. Okay. Awesome. Yeah. 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 And then citizen science projects. So there's um, Amphibian Foundation again has great resources for this. Um, but, and they actually train people in order to ID herps and, you know, show what's in their community. They are based out of Atlanta, but do a lot of work in the Southeast as a whole. Um, and there's a ton of projects. I'm sure the museum has even been involved with a ton of citizen science projects over the years. I've heard of awesome work that has been done with you guys. So yeah, there's yeah, a uh, yeah, we have a citizen science project highlighted um, later this afternoon that we're talking about that, identifying snakes. Yeah, that's awesome. So tune into that. <laughs> Awesome. Yeah. So have, oh, go ahead. I, I have a question about um, handling salamanders. So we, we had a program last night and my mind got blown like 10 times um, uh, with Dr. Mayer's uh, presentation. But one of the things he was talking about was lungless salamanders mm -hmm. and how their skin is five or six cells thick. Yeah. And that just, you know, and so I'm just like, oh my God, that's so thin, right? So is it safe to touch them or should we really be avoiding touching these salamanders? Uh, yeah, that's a great question. Um, and yeah, the entire, there's an entire group of salamanders, some of that I actually covered today that fall under that group of the longest salamanders, the duskies that I covered at the very beginning don't have lungs, really fascinating. Um, I always err on the side of caution and say, you know, it's best to leave any wild animal alone unless you're completely trained on how to touch it and how to handle it. Um, hands off is always the best option. Um, if you do find yourself, you know, wanting to take that photo for iNaturalist, uh, wanting to handle it in some way, 
Um, the best thing for amphibians is do not touch it at all if you have anything on your hands that is a chemical, any lotion, any um, hand soap, bug spray for sure is a really, really, really big no-no. Um, and if you can before, just wash your hands in the river. So even when I'm out in the field, um, I've been doing this for so long, I'm, I just like use no products, essentially, like I forget bug spray exists and I forget hand lotions exist. <laughs> But even still, the first thing I do is, you know, say I'm walking up on a wetland, I'll kneel down and wipe and wash my hands in the water that's present there at that source, not even like tap water or anything, um, just to kind of make sure that my hands are clean, they're not sweaty or dirty. Because yeah, you're touching these really, really sensitive animals and who knows what's on our hands. Our hands look clean to us, but it could in fact impact them. So that's a really great point. Thank you for asking that. Sure. Yeah, so um, I love to, to talk about, you know, the passion that I, I gained for salamanders over the years, just seeing them in the wild and learning from them, because passion leads to action. You know, we talk about how much help these species need, and, um, you know, falling in love with them the way that I have has led me to kind of take action and make sure that I'm helping be part of that change that will inspire you know, conservation for them in the future and maybe some good environmental choices. And I encourage others to do that too. You know, if you feel inspired by these salamanders, keep learning, keep listening and stand up for them where you can. Salamanders, awesome. yeah, go ahead. I was gonna say, if there's one thing that you can tell people to do to help salamanders, what's the, the one thing, the one most important thing we can all do? Oh man, that is such a good question. I just immediately think of like 15 things. So I'll have to. You can give us more than one. It's okay. <laughs> I know. I'm like, oh my goodness. Yeah. I think, you know, the best thing that you can do is just start to start to educate yourself. You know, I, I, it's hard to help something if you don't know much about it. And a lot of, um, you know, good intentions can end up being, you know, bad things. So I'd say the best thing that you can do is learn about amphibians learn about salamanders, um, the plight that is, you know, up against them right now, uh, habitat loss, degradation, and then start to try to stand up for those things, you know, get involved in your community, um, maybe talk to your neighbors about you all making your yards amphibian friendly, and that all of that starts with just learning about them and getting curious. So that'd probably be the, the first step that will lead to many, many steps. Awesome, thank you. Yeah, of course, we're, thank we're, doing a good, we're doing a good job now with Reptile and Amphibian Days. We're all learning so much. I know, I know. I, it's so awesome that you guys have this available for everyone, for sure. Yeah, and um, I mean, it's programs like this that got me inspired to be the person in, on the left here, you know, to enroll in school again. Um, start off when I thought that it was going to be impossible. I can't tell you how many times I thought about quitting how many times I thought there's no way this will ever end. <laughs> there's no way I'll ever graduate. If I graduate, will I get hired? How will this happen? But um, needless to say, that passion has come full circle. So um, who you saw earlier, Jeff Hall, the state herpetologist for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission um, there uh, in 2015 is now my direct boss. So I now professionally get to nerd out and follow him around all day. <laughs> learning about um, our native wildlife here, reptiles and amphibians here in North Carolina and taking direct action to save them. So, you know, I, I promise if you're a student or, you know, an aspiring student and you, know, you don't think that you can do it, I was there. I was that person and you absolutely can. You know, it takes years sometimes. It takes a lot of bumps in the road, a lot of dedication, um, but you can get there for sure. And you know, the species need us to get there. They need us to keep going. And uh, a big full circle moment, again, um, was that my first week for the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission was working with the Noose River water dog. So it's just one of those moments that I'm like, this is crazy. Uh, the first time I really heard about the Wildlife Resources Commission was with the Noose River water dog watch back in 2015 and started helping with field work. And next thing you know, First time wearing the hat, I'm holding a Noose River water dog. So it really all came full circle. There. I love that so much. I love that picture of you with the water dog. 
Thank you. Yeah, I can't hide the joy in my face ever. Right. This giant <laughs> grin. Yeah, and it's because, I mean, look at these guys. They're so special. Um, you know, salamanders, as you've seen from even just the six species that I showed, um, that they're so diverse. They're adaptive. They live in so many different habitats in many different ways. They're mysterious. You know, they're often hard to find. And when we find them, we don't know, you know, much about them. It's funny, you know, the red, um, the red F that we see everywhere. We talked about that salamander as being a super ubiquitous species. Um, that's, you know, found all over North America, it was hard for me to even answer a simple question of like, why would they go back into the water? You know, these are very mysterious species that we're all still actively researching and learning about all the time. And then the gentle nature of salamanders, um, it makes them so much more than just an animal to me, just a salamander. Um, they are teachers and they have stories to tell and lessons to give us if we'll listen to them. I'd love to thank um, the, my wonderful mentors over the year. Um, we got Dr. David Beamer, Dr. John Davenport, both of who I did research under um, on salamanders, many different species actually. Um, my boss that you just heard about, Jeff Hall with the North Carolina Wildlife Resources Commission and Ben Staginga with the Orient Society who really helped solidify me as a herpetologist. And of course the Jack Kent Cook Foundation who made it possible for me to even be a first generation undergraduate. And with that, I'll take any extra questions. Awesome. Well, we have, um, I'll see if some questions come in, but we have some comments I'd like to share with you. Yeah, so, um, so Rebecca is saying that um, try not to litter and see, um, uh, try not to litter. And then if you see trash to get it, to pick it up and yeah. you want to save the river and help the salamanders. Oh. And then Jerry is pointing out that Jeff Hall was a junior curator at the museum. <laughs> Yay, so, yeah. Yes, so we have a junior curator program <laughs> that has been going on for many, 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 oh. many years. Um, and and now so, he's a So, I mean, that's him. <laughs> exactly. Yes. So, our JCs are out in the world doing amazing things. Exactly. So, if you are a young person um, and you live in Raleigh or in the surrounding area, the junior curator program might just be for you. So it's, I think it starts in eighth grade or sixth grade. Jerry, Jerry will correct me if I am. <laughs> I'm sorry. <laughs> so awesome. And we all love, love, love that picture of the salamander in <laughs> the salamander, <laughs> like giving you the stink eye for having him in there. He's <laughs> like, hello, let me out. <laughs> Awesome. Well, Kabra, this has been such a wonderful, inspirational talk. Thank you so much for being here today um, for with Reptile and Amphibian Day. And I'm going to, uh, hold on, I'm going to do this right this time. Anybody who, whenever I host programs, I almost never do this right. So <laughs> here we go. Look at that. My team will be so proud of me. Um, I mean, I either I usually either go too far for a slide or not far enough. So, um, <laughs> so thank you, Kabrin. Thank you, all of you. Thank you. If you are a museum member, if you aren't yet a museum member, you can join during Reptile Amphibian Days and get a free, amazing marbled salamander shirt. So you can just go to the museum store site, um, and if you um, want to get a shirt. Um, let's say you're already a member and you just need more than one, um, you can go to the store and purchase one there. We have uh, a great uh, talk coming up um, at two o'clock. So please join us for that one. It's uh, gonna be Frog Songs of North Carolina. So we are staying on our amphibian kick. <laughs> um, and so thank you, everyone. It's been a pleasure. We'll see you at the next one. Thank you. Bye-bye. Thank you.